So I have a 2006 BMW E91 estate and it has these remote control key fobs. I think they're described as a three button key fob. Uh, you have this arrow button here that unlocks this BMW logo that locks and the third button is a boot trunk unlock. They're pretty straightforward. Obviously you use the button to unlock and the BMW logo to lock them. In case of emergency, they have this little release button key here. That key can be used in the door lock should the remote key fob fail. And that's exactly what's happened to me. And so I thought I'd do a little video about it and about repairing it. First thing I knew about the key fob failing was that I got an indication on the dashboard showing a key logo with the battery pretty self-explanatory that there's a problem with the key battery. And this is quite common on older models where the battery begins to fail over time. And actually on this model, the 2006 model, so it's pre-LCI 2006, the batteries are not replaceable as such. So there's no way to get inside. On the later models, they've actually got a little flap and you can break them open and replace the battery. It's a, like a CR2032, like coin cell battery, and you can replace the battery and everything's fine. And usually these batteries recharge when they're plugged into the dashboard. So they recharge back off the car when they're plugged into the dashboard. And so they last many, many years. Actually on the pre-LCI model or the 2006 one that I've got, BMW generally say that they're non-replaceable battery and they never re need replacing, but whether that's because they never really envisage supporting the cars to this kind of age or not, I don't know. When you get battery failure of a sealed unit like these, there are companies that you can send the unit off to and they will break it open and replace the battery for you. It's actually, again, it's a coin cell battery and I have one here. It's literally the same sort of thing as the replaceable one, but they are solder onto the board batteries. It's actually a VL2020 battery, three volts. They solder onto the PCB, onto the circuit board, and are non-user replaceable. The people that you might send one off to to replace the battery, they're just replacing this, and what they'll do is break the unit open and desolder the old one off the board and solder on a new one. I saw this problem with mine and decided that I was going to do that myself and kind of assumed that that was the issue, that the, the coin cell battery was failing and not holding a charge anymore. And so I would break mine open and replace it myself rather than need it to send it to somebody else to do exactly the same thing. So I broke mine open and they're, they're actually pretty difficult to break open. They're, they're kind of plastic welded or, or glued shut and there's a seam all the way around the outside you can see and you have to cut them open with something like a sharp blade. You know, I use this Stanley blade and you have to just gently score away at them and to the point where you can break a little slit inside and then work your way around literally cutting the seam open. You can see there's like a plastic weld around the outside. Hopefully you can see that. So you can see that seam around the outside that I had to cut open and the uh, waterproof membranes of the buttons. So once you've got it open, you have the circuit board I bought the replacement battery and desoldered the old one and replaced it myself. The problem still existed and actually I then realised that my remote fob wasn't working at all. So pushing the buttons and it was no longer working at all. So something had gone wrong. Now, you know, it's easy to assume that I'd done something wrong when I was replacing the battery. But actually when I was breaking open the enclosure, once I actually got it open, I did hear a little rattle and I wondered what it was and didn't really think much more of it. And I think what had happened through years of using the key fob and, and dropping it on the floor and all kinds of things, what had actually happened was a couple of the components on the circuit board had broken off. And that's why I was getting the initial indication that the battery wasn't recharging because it wasn't recharging and something in the circuit on the charging circuit had broken. And so on closer inspection on the circuit board, so there's one here and one over here. And I can't tell for sure if they are resistors or capacitors. So I'm assuming they're capacitors 
uh, but without having what's fallen off I'm not really going to know so I'm a bit in a bit of a stuck problem here because these units they have to be programmed by BMW or people with the right equipment so it could cost a lot of money to get a replacement and this is actually my only key fob for the car so it uh, causes a bit of a problem. Luckily having the emergency key and the rest of the circuit intact I can actually hold this whole thing back together again. I can use the key to get into the car and with all this kind of held together properly like so I can actually put this back into the dashboard and the car will start and run just fine so the car's not dead without it but I need a remote. So what I'm going to do is try and replace the capacitors that are missing from the circuit board. So what I did was I looked on eBay and found somebody that was selling a key fob. People sell these, you know, people break the cars down or they just happen to have one lost or, or found or whatever. You know, pe people that break the cars, they sell these key fobs as spares. And a lot of people buy them thinking that they can get them reprogrammed for their car. That's not the case. You can't get these reprogrammed. They're programmed once only. And if you need a new key, you have to get it from BMW or somebody that's got the blanks to program new ones. So these are largely useless. So don't buy one off eBay thinking that you can get it reprogrammed for your car as a spare. That's not going to do you any good. Luckily for me, people are selling these. I bought this one so I can break it open in the same way and get those two capacitors off the circuit board and um, hopefully get this one working again. So that's what I'm going to do. So the first step will be to remove the dummy key and just get rid of that because I don't want to get that confused with my real key. I don't need that and it's completely useless now. That does fit a car somewhere but maybe it's been crushed so uh, it's completely useless really and uh, I'll just get rid of that because I don't need it anymore. And I will start by slowly opening this one up and so I've got a blade here and you just have to kind of find a way in and uh, very slowly chop it away. I might actually keep this casing as well because it looks a bit better conditioned than my old one so uh, maybe I'll do that we'll see. But let's start by uh, chopping it open. Right so I'm going to start by uh, just trying to find a way into this thing and let's just make a start. You can just literally try and, um, I don't know if you can see very well, but literally just try and score along the line of the seam with a knife. And you literally want to just get to the point where you cut through that initial seam and once you've got through, I think actually the tip of the blade is actually through already. But once you've got through, you can get the blade in and then sort of work scissoring around, uh, just literally by scissoring around the seam like this. Um, obviously be careful, don't cut yourself. And uh, really you should always cut away from you but that's not actually comfortable in this situation because I want to use my thumb as a bit of leverage so just do whatever works for you without cutting yourself. Just don't put too much pressure on it or it might slip. There we go. It's beginning to go. So just literally once you've got in like that just do this all the way around and just scissor your way around like this and I'll just time lapse the rest of this video just to uh, not be so boring for you so uh, here we go okay coming towards the end now and it's beginning to break open as I would hope and literally just keep following the rest of that seam there we go. It's open. So let's see what we have. Complete circuit board and it's intact. Those components that are missing off of my original are actually present on this one.
don't know if you can see very well or not, but they are present. So now I'm going to remove those uh, little bits off the board. Right, so I've just prepared my tools and just getting some things ready. Some things I'd really recommend would be some solder braid wick. It's copper braid that attracts solder, so you use it to soak up excess solder. Um, that's really useful for desoldering things. A pair of very fine tweezers, which can be really useful for holding components in place or holding onto them, picking them up. Some various little poking things like screwdrivers and such, and uh, just some long nose pliers and a blade and, you know, just little bits and pieces that might come in handy. Some solder. Now you always use leaded solder because, you know, it just flows better. And something quite important, quite useful is some flux. This is a flux pen and what that does is acts a bit like a conduit for the clean surface to attract the solder and just make the solder flow a lot better. So that's really useful. The keen-eyed amongst you might have noticed that these two PCBs are not exactly the same. There are some little component differences, uh, which means they must have been a revision design, you know, slightly different design. But I'm pretty confident that the uh, components that I need, these uh, little tiny capacitors, they'll be within tolerance for the circuit, I'm sure, because they're all based around this little unit here and that unit is exactly the same on both key fobs so I think everything will be fine as far as that's concerned uh, I have some decent confidence in that just zoom in a bit so that you can see the differences if you're that interested uh, so you can see this coil here is different and just some very slight differences in the uh, the layout of the PCB and the placement of the components. So, yeah, not 100% exactly the same. What I'm going to do to begin with, perhaps, is clean up my original board. Just clean the uh, the pads where the old components used to sit. And uh, always good to. Make sure your soldering iron is very clean before you start as well. So get that up to temperature and get it clean. And I'm just going to get some flux flowing on my board there just so that things don't burn out and create a load of mess. Okay, I'm going to zoom in so that hopefully it could be of some use if you can see it well enough. So hopefully you can see that what I'm going to be working with is the component missing from here. See those two pads that uh, used to be holding a little capacitor that's exactly the same as the one next to it here. So that's this two pads here and then we've got the same thing over here. There's one still in place and then there's some pads there where the original is broken off. So if the video is not quite good enough for you to follow exactly what I'm doing, uh, hopefully that shows you what I am going to be replacing. So I'm going to start by just getting some solder flowing the old solder. I'm going to use this uh, copper braid and heat up the pads. And just move them around a bit. There we go. And that just gets rid of any old residue or bits of the old component that might be sitting there still from broken uh, from the broken legs. Okay. 
There we go. And I could actually see when I was heating up the pad there, I could see the uh, other components heating up as well. So I've got to be really careful with the temperature. So I'm going to get the new one or the one that I'm removing the components from and my tweezers. I actually might prefer to hold the board down. So I'm going to get my little vise. Okay, the vise, vise is not going to hold down very nicely. So what I'm going to do is actually pinch the corner of the PCB with these vise grips. Okay, maybe that might be enough to see what's going on. So the one I'm looking for is nearest to the battery. Let's see if it moves. They're heating it up a bit. There we go, that's off, and I want to try and keep it around the same way because I don't know if it's polarised and needs to be in one direction or another. That's it, and it's tiny. That's it there. So that's that one off. And the other one that I want is that one there. So I'm going to try and get that one off. And that is the second one. Hopefully you can see that there. So now to get this PCB out of the way and put them onto the new board. So I'm going to lay that one 
just out of shot, but in line with where they want to go. And can place that new PCB to work with. I'll place there. Just hold it's two in those vice grips. The vice grips aren't tight, so it's not causing a big problem. Right, to start with, I'm going to try and put a little bit of fresh solder on the pads, but first I want to put a bit of flux. Still looks like there might be some copper leftovers on that pad on this side. Uh, see if I can clean that off a little bit. Yeah. You got whatever that was out of the way. Put a little bit more solder on the pad. Both of them there. Now the idea is to hopefully be able to put the components down and hold them in place with the tweezers and just dab the soldering iron on to melt the solder properly in place because I don't have the hands to introduce fresh solder while holding the iron and the tweezers and this is where you realize how incredibly shaky your hands might be but I kind of want to get it in the right place and just dab the solder that's on the board already like so now maybe I can just push down on the component to flatten it on the board properly this time because it's on there now but it's at a little angle and it's a little bit wonky try and straighten it up just a touch there we go, that's straight try and dab the other side and maybe even try and introduce a tiny bit of solder now that I have the first side down and a little bit more flux on you can never use too much flux no such thing as too much flux Hopefully that's done a decent job. Just try and clean that a bit with the flux pen. Let's try number two. Just hope I haven't bridged that connection out there for some reason with a little bit of solder or anything. Don't think so. I think it looks all right. Let's go with number two. It's a bit difficult. Might have got it down with a bit more flux. And hold it down. It's 
think we might be good. I'll try and take a look. Okay, don't know how well you can see there, but we might be lucky. Only one way to find out, and that's go and try it out. Okay, so it appears to lock and unlock correctly now, which is good. I'm just going to put the key into the ignition and just see whether we get an indication on the charging circuit. No sign, which is good. So I think we're all good. I'm going to eject it now. And yes, success. I have repaired the BMW E91 three button remote control. Happy days. Okay, success, it worked. As you see there in that uh, little clip I made with my phone, it just works. And so uh, I have obviously managed to solder that back on and make some decent contact with it. Now, I don't know what to do really about the potentials of this happening again on some of the other components. I could go around and reflow the solder on those, but to be honest for now, I think I'll probably just leave it be. I could potentially do what they call potting and put some epoxy resin on top of the components just to hold them down and stop them shattering. I'm not even sure whether to do that or not. And I think perhaps that if I seal up the casing nicely, that if I have a problem in the future and I open up the casing, I just open it up very, very carefully and the components will hopefully drop out onto my work surface where I can see them. It was just because I didn't realize what had happened when I actually opened this up the first time and I lost those components. So if I was a bit more careful I would have been able to save those components and I wouldn't have lost them and I wouldn't have had to buy this second one. So lesson learned but luckily I've managed to repair it and I'll keep this PCB because the buttons and the other components, even the battery, could be of use in the future. I don't actually think there was anything wrong with my original battery. I don't think it was uh, actually going flat. I think that it was the charging circuit that was a problem the whole time. So that original battery is probably fine as well. But in total, it hasn't cost me an awful lot of money. The replacement battery I originally bought was £4 on eBay. And this spare unit was... I think maybe six or seven pounds delivered from eBay as well. So you can get them and you can use them for replacement parts. I, I have read that the buttons do fail after a while. So these replacement buttons would be useful and it's worthwhile for people to be selling them secondhand for things like the replacement buttons. If you don't get brand new ones, I mean, it'd be easy enough to buy brand new ones when you know what you're looking at. Anyway, yeah, lesson learned. But just a word of warning, you know, don't buy one of these off of eBay thinking that you're going to reprogram it because that's just not possible. If you need a new key fob, you're going to have to go to BMW or to one of these third party people that does do reprogramming. You're never going to be able to reprogram your unit to a secondhand one. Anyway, hopefully you found that useful or interesting and I'll do maybe some more videos a bit like this in the future if, uh, if it's of interest. So right now what I'm going to do is get the old trusty Loctite super glue and I'm going to glue back up around this seam and put it back together again and call that job done. So thanks for watching the video and uh, take care out there.